Hi, I'm Dr. Maddie Deutsch, and I'm here to speak with you about antiretroviral and general health considerations for transgender women living with HIV. So I have nothing relevant to disclose. And I thought I would start out with just some general definitions and help you have a better understanding of the community. I think that better understanding the community terminology, culture, as well as some of the social determinants and some of the behavioral considerations really help you better connect with your patients, better understand some of the factors that may keep them out of clinic or interfere with their ability to engage in care or adhere to antiretroviral medication. Will be, I think this will be very useful for you in implementing in your practice setting. So transgender is a term that describes people who have a gender identity that differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. Gender dysphoria describes a state where there's a, the discordance between your gender identity and sex assigned birth actually causes distress. And so not all transgender people are experiencing gender dysphoria at any given point in time. A lot of transgender people no longer have dysphoria once they've been able to access a range of gender affirming interventions and treatments, including hormone therapy or surgery. Uh, the problem is that the ICD coding scheme does not have a diagnostic code for the care of a transgender person who does not have dysphoria and just needs maintenance hormone therapy, for example. Uh, all transgender people, if you're going to be using the ICD encoding for a trans-specific reason, have to be given this diagnosis of gender dysphoria, which is a stigmatized uh, diagnosis. And there's movement in ICD-11 towards referring to it as gender incongruence and working on destigmatizing the term. But still, there is some work to be done just around diagnostic categorization. So the reason I wanna put that out there right at the front is just show you that at the very core in a medical model, transgender people feel that they've been both medicalized and pathologized before they even walk through the door. One other term I wanted to find for you is cisgender. So many of us took organic chemistry. Many of us don't really know why. I know the pharmacists in the audience don't think that's a funny statement, but uh, I certainly was no fan of organic chemistry. Uh, but you do learn the cis and trans prefixes and cis means same or next to in Latin, whereas trans means across. So if you are not transgender, meaning your gender identity and the sex you were assigned at birth are aligned, then you are cisgender. So what I'm gonna speak about here is very Western oriented, is very North America, Europe, Australia centric approach. I will speak broadly in order to just define some constructs and then we'll try to contextualize it for other cultures and particularly Asia because of where the focus of this conference is. So your gender identity is really how you self-identify, the way that you live and move through the world. It is what is in your mind. And it can be male, it can be female, it could be something else like non-binary, gender queer. Again, this is Western English language terminology and context. Your gender expression is how you outwardly present your gender. How do you tell the world about your gender? What sort of gender do you present on the outside? Are you feminine? Are you masculine? Are you androgynous in your presentation? And it's important to remember that these do not necessarily have to be aligned with one another in a way that one might assume. People may have to vary their gender expression depending on the context that they're in. They may not be able to be out or visibly trans in certain life or cultural contexts. And then they code switch at other times into a different expression. Your sexual orientation really is a multi-dimensional representation of your sexuality. It really describes how you identify sexually, what kind of people you're attracted to, what kind of sex acts you engage in. It really is a different set of dimensions than our gender identity. Now, full stop, in many non-English speaking cultures and even some subcultures within the English speaking world, there can be some conflation and some blurring of the lines between gender identity, sexuality, and sexual orientation. I don't wanna to get too into that because in the kind of purest, like a sociological sense of the word, these are constructs and ways to look at it. But remember that everybody is an individual, cultures are different and people may have different blurred lines in terms they use. 
In fact, this was a study done in China and they took an inventory of a range of Chinese language terms that are used to describe different gender identities, different trans identities. And they also not only provided the literal translation, but they also provided a meaning and then also some kind of measure of whether this was a positive, negative, or a neutral kind of perceived term. Some of these terms can have stigma. And from culture to culture and language to language, the stigma can be different. The connotation could be negative or positive. So don't really want to get too much into that, but just wanted to put out there that these are considerations and that the cultural context and terminology are important. The most important thing is patients will tell you who they are and what terminology they use. And we can really just embrace that and focus on recognizing and respecting the patient's identity so that we can move forward with treating them. How many trans people are there? Well, there've been a few population level study, uh, studies done most of them have been in the Western context, uh, but these are, oh, you can take a look at this slide and review it, but you can see from four population uh, samples that were done, three in the US and one in New Zealand, one, uh, these are number per 100,000, so this would be 1.6%, this would be 0.45%, this would be 0.33%, and this would be 1.2%. So there's some older studies, some, some methodologically flawed studies that are saying one in 30,000, one in 50,000. And there are a lot of flaws with the way that those studies were done. The more uh, current population health level studies that we have are showing this, uh, this range of you know, half a percent, 1%, 1 1.5%. 1 it's really a non-trivial population size. Okay, what about HIV burden? So this was a review article done uh, several years ago, looking at uh, studies uh, from different countries and pooling them together and then conducting an analysis. And so the pooled worldwide estimate of HIV in prevalence in transgender women is 19%. And you can see there are a couple of outlier countries here showing low numbers like Australia 4.5%, Pakistan 2.2%, Vietnam 6.7%. It is unlikely that the prevalence of HIV in transgender women in those countries is significantly lower than the global average or the general trend that you see for all of these countries here. What is more likely is there are some methodologic limitations in the way that those data have been collected. And I will uh, show you some data later on that will describe that. So a number of factors impact HIV risk and outcomes in trans populations. All of these factors are involved in uh, stigma these are all things that we understand how they lead to HIV risk, and they also can lead to poor adherence and poor engagement in care. So I just wanted to put this up here. In addition to behavioral factors, there are direct linkages between trauma and psychosocial and behavioral contributors to actual inflammatory changes in the body that result in activation of the adrenal axis, resulting in increased inflammation, cardiometabolic, and other health risks. And so, uh, particularly in an HIV context where we're already concerned about increased cardiometabolic risk due to inflammatory changes. These are additional things to think about. So there are additional biomedical pathways that trauma and cumulative trauma, psychosocial distress can directly impact inflammation in the body. This is called the model of gender affirmation. It was developed by Dr. Sevilius at UC San Francisco where I am. And it describes ways in which stigma, psychological distress, distress, oppression, as well as a decreased access to gender affirmation as in the context of an increased need for gender affirmation creates an identity threat, which is there's an excess need for gender affirmation that is available or provided, can be directly linked to high risk, risk contexts that result in risk behaviors that in, in this particular model put patients at risk of HIV but truthfully, this could explain uh, a pathway towards risky behaviors of any type or behaviors that uh, are self-harming or otherwise cause harm to, some, to oneself. So I'm hoping that you understand how trauma, stigma, shame, these uh, discrimination, these things are all interrelated and result in the overall uh, picture that you might see with transgender people where there can behavioral, be behavioral issues as well as linkage to care, engagement and care and self-care uh, difficulties and limitations. So here's some data that I would like to go through uh, from the Asia region. And so this was a study just showing that uh, high rates of abuse, neglect, and bullying in trans and non-binary youth and children. So 
and there were high rates of depressive and anxiety symptoms in youth. So this stuff starts when trans people are young. These are adverse childhood events, and then they magnify through life. So, and then you can see there was very high rates in the study of parental abuse or neglect, 93% experienced parental abuse or neglect, very high rates. And then you can see all these different contexts and forms of abuse, neglect, bullying exist. And so this is all what's going on in the background in a trans person's life. High rates of social isolation, family rejection and discrimination, uh, low rates of HIV testing from this particular study in China. Uh, someone describing how their dad would beat them when they refused to answer if they were male or female. And then also um, people are unaware of their HIV status. They don't know how to engage in care. They're not, there's not that community level fluency of you need to go get an HIV test and knowing where to do it. So this was a respondent driven sampling study of HIV rates among women in Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh City. And um, 16.5% prevalence of HIV in this sample uh, of trans women from Ho Chi Minh City. And then you can see that 4%, 4 which is 19 out of 456, which is um, nearly a quarter of those people in the sample who are HIV were unaware of their HIV status until this study tested them and found it out. So uh, very concerning. This is a study from Tehran looking at HIV prevalence and sexual behaviors among trans women. And you can see here that uh, uh, high rates of transaction sex, which is related to survival, high rates of no condom use because of lack of empowerment and people actually get paid more when they uh, don't use a condom in many cases. Overall HIV prevalence was only 2% in this sample, but there was a very high bar to be included in the study. You had to have been diagnosed by an institute psychiatrist and completed six months of uh, post-surgery. So likely that patients who have more complex psychosocial issues, which place them at higher risk for HIV, were not able to meet this bar and were excluded from the study. So this is an example of how methodologic limitations can result in us under measuring the impact of the epidemic in transgender women. Uh, this is a study of looking at hormone use among Nepali transgender women. So hormone use, we're gonna talk about that in a moment, but hormone use plays a huge role. It is of huge importance for transgender women uh, as part of their gender affirmation. And uh, up to 80% of trans women in Nepal were using unsupervised hormones, taking up to four contraceptive pills a day, high rates of avoidance of the healthcare system, even though there are national protective laws on the books in Nepal. So even with legal protections, there still are not cultural and structural changes at the societal and interpersonal level that makes people feel comfortable going to access clinical care. So I wanted to talk about uh, some factors that, uh, that drive treatment interruptions and things that are associated with poor adherence. Uh, and so this was a study done actually in the US of black and Latina trans women. This first slide actually just shows the HIV uh, care continuum. And you can see that uh, not doing great. You know, interestingly, undetectable viral load uh, rates were fairly high, even though the retention on uh, treatment uh, was lower. So anyway, I just wanted to illustrate this to you that there is room for improvement on the care continuum. In this particular study, these were some factors. Everything that's bolded here was associated with antiretroviral adherence, so or non-adherence, depending on how you want to look at it. So barriers to accessing, accessing health care, lifetime suicidal ideation, hormone use, highly associated, as well as gender affirming surgery, highly associated with antiretroviral adherence. So there's some potential for biases and unmeasured factors in there. But the important thing is that, as you can see that that identity threat is coming up again, that gender affirmation, that access to gender affirmation is a huge component of linkage to and retention in HIV care. So just briefly mentioning hormone therapy, there are a number of standards and guidelines out there and, and you can take a look at them and see which one kind of makes the most sense to you and resonates with you the best and most appropriate to your practice setting. I don't really have the time, unfortunately, to get into them in too much detail, but wanted to put that there for you. Clinical endpoints for people seeking uh, hormone therapy, generally for people seeking a binary or kind of what I would call maximal effects get their testosterone in the female range, you add back some estrogen, arguably at the lowest tolerable dose. And then there's some other detail in here for transmasculine people, 
that I don't really have time to get into, as well as for people who have a more of a non-binary or whose goal is to have less than a maximal degree of feminization or masculinization, I generally kind of follow some of the guidelines that I just shared with you, have some detail on that, and then work with the patient. If you're able to monitor lab tests to kind of verify hormone adherence and talk to the patients about what that means, that might be a great way to link them into and get better engage them in care, get them more motivated about general health care as well as HIV care. The general approach to feminizing hormone therapy is to use an estrogen along with an androgen blocker, uh, most commonly used as spironolactone in Western contexts, and then sometimes a progestogen is used. So what I do want to say is that, you, you know, without having time to really get into too much detail on hormone therapy, but the psychosocial benefits of hormone therapy usually include positive lifestyle changes and a better self-image that can reduce things like obesity, glucose and lipid disorders. So if you're worried about inflammatory conditions or cardiovascular issues with hormone therapy, often the, just the benefit of being on hormone therapy, there's just so many benefits psychosocially that they outweigh any of, any of the theoreticals, which are actually very minimal, if any, risk, if you look at some of the data, which we don't have time to do here. So let's speak briefly about ART, hormone interactions. So there are data uh, on contraception uh, interactions with antiretrovirals, and that can apply in uh, feminizing hormone therapy, because while in general, the recommendation is to use bioidentical estrogens for feminizing hormone therapy, which is basically like menopausal hormones, and not the synthetic estrogens that are used in contraceptive preparations. A lot of times, as you sh I showed you earlier, um, transgender women are using contraceptives for their feminizing care, often self-medicating, or that's all that's available from the formulary in that particular context. So in any case, looking at data on contraception interactions with antiretrovirals, it is mixed. But most of the data suggests that the impact would be, if at anything, on the effectiveness of the contraceptive, not on the antiretrovirals. So th this can raise concerns with transgender women because often they prioritize hormone therapy over other treatments. So they don't want to have um, antiretrovirals affecting the progress of their feminization. So we'll talk a little bit that in a moment. But the reality is, is that while it may impact the effectiveness as a contraceptive, we're not worried about contraception. So it's unlikely that there's any significant interaction in, in that direction. Uh, there's probably not much of an interaction in the direction of impact on antiretrovirals with regards to treating HIV. And then, you know, just kind of put that out there, do these studies apply these feminizing hormone contexts? We just don't know. There's a citation there that you can review if you're, if you're so motivated. So these last couple of slides, what I want to share with you, these are a couple of studies done on pre-exposure prophylaxis and interactions in this particular study that I was a, a co-PI for, interaction between tenofovir and feminizing hormones. We did direct observe therapy. Uh, the short story is we looked at dried blood spots. We used historical controls from a group of transgender women who are HIV negative taking PrEP. And we found that uh, this is CGW cisgender women and TGW transgender women. So you can see that transgender women after four weeks of PrEP did have lower levels in their dry blood spot of tenofovirac diphosphate than did cisgender male or cisgender female controls. And if the magic number for levels in dry blood spots is about seven to 800 for 90% risk reduction, then you could say, hmm, maybe some of these transgender women are dipping down a little bit uh, below the threshold of treatment. Not really clear, it's, uh, you know, even with the error bar there, it's, it's probably not clinically significant, but there is a statistical significance there. I'm gonna actually come back to that slide. I want, so I want to show you this slide first. This was another study that looked at pretty much the same thing using slightly different methods. And they also looked at emtricitabine levels as well as tenofovir. And they looked at tenofovir as well as tenofovir diphosphate. And the solid line are cisgender female controls. The dashed line are transgender females. And you can see there's statistically significant lower levels of both drugs at different time points after another DO, this is a directly observed therapy PK study. So these two studies suggest that there may be a slight lowering of tenofovir or emtricitabine levels in the context of hormone therapy. Whether or not that's clinically significant is 
probably not. Where it may come up is in 211 dosing. So if you have someone who's going to be do episodic prep dosing, or if you have somebody who has adherence challenges and normally say about four pills a week is adequate to get you to that magic number of protection, maybe you need five pills a week of, of adherence for transgender women to reach that, that protective level. We need more data on this particular topic. But the take home is that it is highly unlikely that there's a large effect size of any impact of feminizing hormones on PrEP effectiveness. If anything, it's probably very small. And so PrEP should still be given. What I do wanna show you is that this was just very briefly, estradiol levels before and after four weeks of PrEP use in our study did not statistically change. So this is as more reassurance that um, the antiretrovirals are not gonna have a negative effect on hormone therapy for transgender women. And the last, this is, this is just another table of, of hormone data from that second study that you can take a look at in your handout if you like. And so uh, just to really to summarize, the data are limited, we need more data. And then these two recent DOT studies uh, found what I said, so you can take a look at this in your handout. Last topic, I just wanna put this one slide up here. Soft tissue filler injections are commonly used by transgender women who don't have access to gender affirming care. They may have large volume injections by unsupervised or unlicensed providers. Sometimes it's referred to as silicone, but it really can be any of these things, fix a flat medical grade silicone that's obtained and given in large volume, like two to three liters. And there can be a whole range of inflammatory and soft tissue damage, granulomae that develop. There's a case report of somebody developing an iris syndrome uh, that was triggered by the presence of subcutaneous silicone fillers. This is a whole other topic. I just wanted to put it on your radar that it's something out there that exists. And you know there have been at least been case reports of iris developing when someone has these indwelling injections. And now I believe we will go to questions. Thank you very much.